you know, we think of the Sistine Chapel as being something that is, uh, it, it's almost like it will never disappear, it will always be there, but it could, you know, there could, something could happen, and there was a Pope who even wanted to paint over it, because he thought there was too much nudity, he, and he died, and that was a good thing, because he died before, <laughs> before he got to it, so. It was my space, and they were just like, oh. The Harbour Lakes excursion with double to have a time. that there is screen printing and that there's art actually happening in this room and that some of you have glasses of wine. I feel like we're setting the mood right away. Some of you are covered in paint. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you're gonna read a little bit of the book before yeah. we start and we'll have a conversation. Okay, so we thought we'd set the tone and I would read a little bit. So I'm reading a bit from the, it's from the first time that I finally started to see something that clicked for me in the Sistine Chapel after going to visit it a few times. And uh, since the book is partly about, well, mainly it's about the experience of the Sistine Chapel, I thought this would give a little sort of sense of what it was. Okay. I managed to get a seat on a bench under the scene of the flood where I could rest my head against the wall while I looked up. The deluge is the end of the story, the end of the world as Noah knew it. Though this is the last of the sequence of central panels, Michelangelo painted it first. He painted the destruction of the world before painting its creation. He considered himself a sculptor rather than a painter, and art historians speculate that he wanted to warm up before he painted God. I tried to find my way into this image by noticing the details that I had read about before I came to visit. Details such as the white patch in the sky where the plaster fell off in 1797 when the gunpowder depot at Castel San Angelo exploded. Though it's hard to see from below, a woman carries a jug nestled between the legs of a table that she is balanced upside down on her head as she walks out of the water. Michelangelo had a similar jug in his own kitchen. These facts allowed me to focus on a few particulars, providing a way into this part of the fresco. But then as I looked at the people struggling to get out of the water, it occurred to me that they're not survivors as I had so lazily been thinking of them. No one who isn't in the ark survives this flood. These people are about to die. The water is rising. This image captures a moment when they still have hope, but we know their hope is misplaced because we know this story. In these circumstances, the table and the jug will be useless to the woman who has gone to so much effort during her last moments on earth to carry them with her. The mother and her children will not survive. They don't know it yet, but we do. Everything that seemed important before the flood is now inconsequential, and yet there's a woman carrying a table and a jug. I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I made them. This is what God says in the King James Version of Genesis in the story of the flood. These people have become wicked, he says, and their hearts evil. The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth, says God to Noah when instructing him to build the ark. But Michelangelo doesn't depict these people as God describes them. And instead, we see people emerging from the water naked and vulnerable, helping and carrying each other, rescuing a few practical household items in the hope that their lives will continue and they will need them. It's the artist's sympathy for God's victims that made me see them as survivors before I thought about the story. It's our tendency to identify with Noah and his family, the actual survivors, but this depiction causes us to consider the fear and anguish and even the humanity of the condemned. Seen through half-closed eyes, the deluge resembles a picture that has been partly whitewashed. The world is a picture that God can unpaint at any moment, wrote art historian Andrew Graham Dixon who seemed like me to be transfixed by these shades of gray. I had read that line before I ever saw the fresco, but now I could see how the artist painted the sky meeting the flood water in a way that obliterates them both, as it does in reality in the pale light of a storm. He used the same shade for the sky and the sea, a pigment made by friars in a convent in Florence from roasted cobalt and glass and then ground likely by one of Michelangelo's assistants, until it reached this deathly pale blue verging on gray. This panel is more detailed than the other frescoes, 
and is even harder to see from the ground than most of them. But resting on the bench in that room, looking at the blue grayness of the water, the sky and the clouds, I thought of a smothering airless nothingness. The sounds of shuffling feet and murmurs fused into a hum. The movement of people around me changed character and became like a slowly welling, swelling wave that never crests but only dissolves before it swells again. It's one thing to know the story of the flood and another to feel it, to feel the loss of anything like hope or future and to sense the blunt force of finality. Annihilation is in the midst of happening in this image, but this is destruction by God. And this image tells us to seek redemption, to change our lives, or we'll soon be dragging ourselves and our useful, useless possessions onto a shore that will not save us. Do it now while there is still time. There's something menacing, wrathful, and angry going on up there, and it feels like a warning. I shivered while I watched my fellow men and women stumbled about underneath, looking up to the ceiling and tripping over other people, looking down to find their way but missing what's going on above. All these people in the chapel had their own reasons for being there. Some were devout Christians, some were art lovers, some were checking it off their list of touristic sites. I still wasn't clear about my own vague motivations. We all want something from the Sistine Chapel. We want to understand it, but we also want some of its glory sprinkled upon us like holy water. We want to take hold of the messages painted in the, in the plaster to gain some insight into life here on earth and to figure out how to live. We want to be people who have seen the Sistine Chapel. But even our shallower motivations lie on top of something more profound, the desire to see and be touched by greatness and to discern its meaning in our lives. When we arrive, if we're really looking, we'll see that Michelangelo is not showing us something beautiful, though there is beauty in it, but horror and destruction, the possibility that all our worldly concerns are pointless, that if the world ceased to exist, both our most precious and utilitarian objects would amount to nothing. We were nothing and will be nothing, for dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. Michelangelo blends the sky and the sea at the horizon into a void, an unbearable emptiness. Yet to recognize that void is somehow thrilling. As I sat there against the wall and mostly oblivious to the irritation I was causing by taking too much time on the bench, I felt like I'd experienced something essential and terrifying. At that extreme moment of isolation, I felt like the ant who has suddenly grasped the colony. I felt a part of something much bigger than what I can see, yet also alone. By staring and staring at the ceiling, I was struggling toward an answer to a question I hadn't properly asked. It brought forward childhood fears of a vast and incomprehensible universe, of seemingly senseless violence in the world, and of the anger and the anguish I'd seen in people I loved. The need to control my own life seemed crucial and my ability to do so felt impossible. Any thought that I was in charge seemed in that moment to be shamefully arrogant, and so the answer to the question of how to live seemed to slip in and out of my hands. The idea of existence was outrageously unlikely. How is it that all the men, the beasts, the creeping things, and the fowls of the air exist? And how do I? And since we do exist, shouldn't it all mean something? Though woven into that question is the fear and the dread that none of it means anything. OK, I'll stop there, but it gets a little more optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're going to return to the Sistine Chapel, but I mean, I think life in Italy, let's face it, has been romanticized in so many films and books, and I think probably some of us in this audience have some ideas of what that is like, and maybe you could talk a little bit about, um, did you have any romantic ideas of what life was going to be there before you went? Oh, yeah. I mean, firstly, yeah. I thought, first I thought I'd learn Italian in six months. Mm -hmm. I'd be fluent, no problem. So it's been 21 years, and I'm still constantly learning, still making mistakes all the time. Um, I thought I'd become way more fashionable. <laughs> I'm just, I still wear black all the time. I do the same things I always did. Uh, but the one thing that has been really true is, well, the food is amazing. That's true. Don't, <laughs> don't worry. That's really true. But also just that the art that is all around there is incredible. And, you know, it took... It, if you go on a holiday, it's really hard to absorb mm. how much there is and how much art history there actually is in, in the city itself and even just in the free places that you can go to in the churches and in the piazzas. But uh, over time, you start to build up a sense of, you know, of uh, oh, this was painted 
at this time and this architect designed this and just without even meaning to you start to mm. develop a sense of the history and particularly of the Renaissance and of the medieval period as well. So that was wonderful and somewhat, un maybe somewhat, not unexpected, but I didn't imagine it to take up so much room in my life as it did. Mm -hmm. Well, how would you describe your relationship to art before you went? Well, I've always been interested, but it was actually the modernist period that interested me the most. Mm -hmm. And then I spent some time in Spain and I was really interested in, um, uh, you know, the art that I could see there that was just, there was something about, uh, you know, I mean, that was also, there was modernist art, there was Picasso and Miro and, um, there was just something kind of exuberant about that art. And then coming to Rome and seeing all this religious art at first was, I just thought, oh, no, thank you. I don't know. And uh, although it was beautiful and colorful, it took a while for me to find my way into it. So I had to live there 21 years to, <laughs> to figure it out. <laughs> and what about your writing? Did that change as well? Just being, being surrounded by art and, you know, outside of this book, did you approach things differently than perhaps you had in Canada? Yes, I'm sure I did. And part of that is just getting older as well. But I think also because I was separated from my own culture and from English culture, although I would read a lot of things, it's different. I've just been here for three weeks and, it, and meeting a lot of writers and I feel like I've absorbed so much that I've been missing. But also, I think it's not bad to be cut off a little bit, too. You kind of go into your own head a little more mm. and um, read more because you don't know so many people. So, <laughs> Right. Do you have a writing community there at all? Or? A little bit. Uh, I think there is more than I take advantage of. There are a few English, particularly American universities in Rome, and they mm -hmm. all have writing programs. And so um, some of my friends teach in these programs. Uh, one friend in particular who's a poet has been really, really helpful to me. And just partly the, the first time I met her, she said, why don't we go out and drink wine and read poems? And I said, okay, let's do that. So, that so we did. And then we, we drank too much wine, I think. But <laughs> we, we read a lot of poems. And we did this a few times. And I just liked the fact that we could sit down, talk for two or three minutes about whatever's going on in our lives. And she would send me the poems ahead of time. Hmm. And then we would read them together and kind of go through them. And it was way more fun than I ever imagined something like that could be. So that was great. And also, because she's a poet, she made me think about writing differently. And she, after my book was finished, she looked at it. And because she's a formal poet, she said, oh, you used a braided structure. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and I had no idea <laughs> that what I, you know, I could see what she meant afterwards. But I, I didn't see it at the time. But I thought, well, maybe I picked it up by osmosis, hanging out with a formal poet. These things happen. Mm. And am I correct in saying, did this start as an essay and then come yes. through into a book? Yes. So the first chapter is, was the first essay. And I thought at first that that was it, that was all I needed to do, but, um, but I kept going and then I kept thinking about it. And, and I talked to some of the editors that I worked on with the first chapter and they were encouraging me to, to try to look at the whole, because I was only looking at part of the ceiling at that point. They said, do the whole thing. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I thought also, I really, you know, that is a big ceiling, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But they were right. I mean, once you start to look at one part, you only understand that part, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. you do have to look at each little piece, and even the the pieces that go between the the panels, you have to look at that and understand what's going on. There's symbols everywhere, right. like the symbols of the acorns are meant to symbols of that Pope Julius II, because he was um, uh, his last name was Rovere, his original name, and that means oak in Italian. So he was paying homage to his patron by painting the, the acorns into it. But you initially resisted going at all. Like, this is a part of this narrative. It's like, nope, Sistine Chapel, not for me. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about <laughs> that and then maybe what that moment was where you're like, okay, fine. Well, I think some of it is an exploration in the book is about why I was so resistant. And some of it is, what I'm, so I've since met many people who have lived in Rome for a long time and never been to the Sistine Chapel, so it's not just me. But, um, and some of it is just that it's a tourist draw. It's, um, it's not a huge space, so no matter what, you are mm -hmm. almost always going to be in a crowded room. So that makes it difficult. It's also that it's very old, it's very religious, and it's really big. So it's daunting and overwhelming, and you feel a little bit inadequate to deal with that. 
without doing an entire four-year Bachelor of Arts in art history to understand the context. So, so there was that. But I also, as I was going along, I started realizing that there were more personal reasons, that my mother had a kind of fraught relationship with Catholicism. And, and this made me understand, as I started to read it, I started to understand, oh, the Catholicism that is presented on the ceiling is actually different from the Catholicism that my mother was, hmm. was angry with. And so that was interesting, but I also didn't understand it, and I didn't. I did realize that there were certain things. I don't know if you call them triggers, but there were just things that made me recognize that some of the resistance was also that I. I didn't understand why she was so angry about it. Like when I was little, I was allowed to go to any church. I used to get on these little school buses in the small town we lived in, and you could go to any, um, any of the Sunday schools, and you. I loved it because you go have the stories, you have the little sandwiches, have the cookies, and everything. And I could go to any of them, but not the Catholic Church. And I never really understood, why not? They probably have great cookies, but I couldn't go there. <laughs> uh, I didn't, I, I'm talking about mine. Did you they did not cookies? miss anything. Know, the no. were not. Actually, we didn't even have a Sunday school. They made us sit upstairs <clears throat> with the adults. And See, I thought the Catholics would be more fun. Oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I remember um, deciding that I wanted a snack, so I snuck into line to get a little bit of the communion and being yanked out by oh. somebody was like, yeah, sorry, not for you. That's not but, okay. But uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, I don't think he missed anything, but that's interesting that it was, how much time are you spending at this point with the frescoes where you're starting to sort of make these connections? with? Well, I think it was kind of all, not all my time, but of course, but I, I do a lot of editing work and it's, it's, um, you know, you just sit in a room and stare at some pages and edit, and edit, edit. And then to take a break, I would usually go and either go to the Vatican website and look at the mm -hmm. images online, or I would read some, some of it in books. So it was almost the thing I did to relax hmm. a lot of the time and also go look in the evenings. And then whenever I could go, I would actually just go. And I, was, I had this obsession with finding when was the best time. So I can tell you, the last two weeks of January, especially if it's rainy, it's really good. That's the best time, it's the best time to go. Or a pandemic, <laughs> it's really good. Because they opened it right after they closed for three months and then oh. still there was no tourism in Italy, but they opened the Sistine Chapel. Okay. So the, and they only let about 20 people in at a time. And so the only people there were people who lived in the city because you couldn't get Fantastic. into the city otherwise. So that was actually kind of great and kind of sad at the same yeah. time. But. But it gave you that physical space to be able to spend more time with Yes. You. Well, sort of. Except the one thing I didn't like, I don't know why they did it, but there are benches around the room. And it, the best thing is if you can sit down for a few minutes, you can actually look without being pushed here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, and they taped up all the benches so you couldn't sit down. So they were still shoving you out, out of the room, even though there weren't many people there. I think it's just habit. They just... Mm -hmm. their jobs, you know, to get you in the room and get yeah. you out of the room yeah. as well. So was there, after going, was there an aha moment or was it like a gradual sort of thinking about this work and... Well, a little of both. I think the moment that um, when I really got to sit down and look at the, uh, the painting of the flood, that really was the time. And it's interesting because in some ways that's, that's the the part, the fresco that people don't like the most because it's kind of, it's a little bit detailed and it's also the part that he painted first. So he became a better painter as he moved through the, through the whole room. But I found that it was not, like once I realized it's not like the other depictions that I've seen, usually you're looking at the, at the ark and you're looking at Noah and mm -hmm. his family and the animals going two by two. And so this was different to actually contemplate who's being left behind and why. Mm -hmm. and and this religious painter is not painting them, is painting them with sympathy. That was really a surprise. And also just that feeling, you just really, when you look at it, you really do have a sense of what it might feel like to, to know that you're not going to make it, you're mm -hmm. not going to get out of the flood. And I was surprised that I did have that feeling considering hmm. that I was sitting down and staring yeah. up like that. So that, was, that to me was a moment where I thought, oh wait, there is a lot more to this. And I'm really glad I persisted because that probably is the least interesting part of the, of the whole ceiling. So it got even better after that. 
And where were you turning for research? Like you said, you were looking <clears throat> at um, images online, but like in terms of sort of all of these details, well, where were you learning that from? Uh, well, a lot, yeah, so many places, a lot of books. Of course, there are many books written mm -hmm. about the Sistine Chapel and really great historians who have, have done so much work, Italian historians as well. I mean, the Italian, it's interesting because there's a real, um, Often that some some Italian historians are translated into English, but there are many who are, who aren't. So I looked at those, but I also my um, my son gave me his password to the JSTOR account from his school, so <laughs> I used I used that and looked up a lot of because there are a lot of journals, art history journals. So I would look at what contemporary scholars were writing about, and that would give me some clues as to where to look, as well. That was quite interesting. Um, and also guidebooks, that was interesting because the guidebooks simplify things. So you look at it in the most simple way and then you look at what they're telling you is important and then I would go off and research from there as well. And everyone I know is trying to get, um, is trying to get access to the Sistine Chapel in some special way, like can I pay someone so I can go in by myself? Or I have a friend who um, did some work for a custodian and he, took them in at night and told them <gasps> wow. not to tell anyone. He took them in and showed them they got to, they weren't allowed to take any pictures or do anything, but they got to go in and oh, see it. Oh, that's amazing. I thought it would be great, but I also realized that then you get caught up in the experience of that special mm -hmm. moment and probably miss everything that you actually went there to see because you're so excited about being in the room yeah. by, by yourself with it. So I found that being in the room was important to know, firstly, how to look at the whole thing and how to watch other people who are looking at it. but it was easier to look online and look on the Vatican website. You could see the details and blow it up and you could look very carefully at things you wanted to see. And when you're observing other people, what are you looking for? What interested you in other people's reactions to the work? Well, it's hard to tell sometimes what's going through people's minds, but you can see the people who are irritated. They <laughs> get fairly clear. So you can see that when someone's just trying desperate to, you know, they've already gone through the whole museum and they're tired by that point. And I would sometimes talk to people, you can't talk in the chapel, but on the way out and ask them what their impressions were, if they'd seen it before. I got to actually found the tour guides are interesting because they go frequently mm. and they really know a lot about, there's one in particular who I, I got to know and she, she could probably call up any image just you know, without looking at it, she Incredible. knows all of it. And the, the guys who are known, the guards who are known as the shushers, they actually are there. It's a job that is a, a plum job and they compete for it. And it's because they all love it. They love mm -hmm. that room and so they want to be there, even though they're making enemies all around by shoving everybody out <laughs> of the room. But, but I thought it was interesting to realize that they're there because they actually love the artwork and they want to see it. That must be, I can't imagine having a job where you get to see to, to experience that yeah. every day. Well, and one of them day. told me that it's not, what, the thing he loved was that sometimes you got to go in and open the door, open the room. And it was like that moment where it's been quiet all night, mm. you open the room, you're the first person to step in. And there was something kind of thrilling about doing that. And I said, can I come? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. And I dragged my son there when he was 10. That was another little experiment, he and a friend, just to see if <laughs> it uh, had any effect on them. But they were... They'd seen a lot of religious art by that point, so to them it wasn't really special, and yeah. and it was really also hot and summer, and not a great, not a great thing to do. Sometimes too, you can get um, museum head. Yes, it's like Ike the way you feel in IKEA sometimes. Mm -hmm. it's the same yes, feeling. exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah. and especially in a museum like that where there's one way in and you have to follow the path, and so, and I don't. I think they've done it differently at different times when you could just go directly into the Sistine Chapel. And certainly in the, you know, in the 19th century, I mean, Henry James used to just walk in all the time. So you could wander in without having to go through the museum. And it's difficult because the museum is interesting. You know, it's full of amazing sculptures and mm -hmm. art that you actually do want to stop and look at. So you, do, you can become very tired once you actually get into the room. And also that um, there's some lighting, but they, there's a lot of windows, so it's natural light. There's something mm. about the lighting I always find that's a bit tiring in there too. Mm. I guess during COVID too, and also I work on a art magazine, so I look at a lot of 
visuals and paintings and sculptures online all day and mm -hmm. just the difference of going to see something in person and in particular after COVID. Yes. Like it was just like, oh, it felt like such a relief. Yes. And, um, so it's incredible that you were able to have both of those experiences for um, different purposes as you were working on this. Yes, and definitely going after COVID, I appreciated that being able to be back in the room with other people and also that it just felt really important because you know we think of the Sistine Chapel as being something that is uh, it, it's almost like it will never disappear it will always be there but it could you know there could something could happen and there yeah. was a pope who even wanted to paint over it because he thought there was too much nudity he and he died and that was a good thing because he died before, <laughs> before he got to it so it's <laughs> So you think about it, like he could have just painted over it. He could have said, do wow. it, and that would have happened. That's incredible. And there are earthquakes. I don't think that Rome is actually not as vulnerable to the earthquakes. It's actually the David in Florence everyone worries about mm -hmm. because it is vulnerable. <clears throat> There's a, like a fault in the ankle, and they do. And you look at it, and you realize it's just standing there. And there was a big earthquake recently in Florence, and that was the first thing everyone wanted to know, is the David OK? But he, he was fine. So you th but you think something could happen. What if there was a leak in the ceiling? That happens oh, all yeah. the time, to my house anyway. And um, <laughs> there's some churches I go to into Rome, and there's so many of them, and then it can't all be, be maintained. There's yeah. one, um, San Pietro in Vincoli, that has uh, uh, Michelangelo's Moses is there. So it's a sculpture. But I was looking around, and you realize there's water damage everywhere in that church coming down the walls. You know, they have a little box that you can put a donation in for the renovations of the church and that's just one church and that's a mm -hmm. that's an important church as well mm -hmm. so sometimes i think i know they're taking care of the sistine chapel because it's you know it would be so shameful if something were to happen but you think something could happen there yeah. could be a crack there, you know something that's not being watched constantly so i feel like i felt like it, it was not as invincible as i had felt like maybe mm. that was from feeling that I wasn't as invincible. Yeah. So I felt that it isn't either, may not, you know, mm. I'm sure that it will be fine. I'm not obsessing over it, but it, uh, it did strike me that it is, it could disappear, something could happen. Or even, you know, could just someone could, I don't know, like there could be a change in politics and that could change something as well. Mm -hmm. It could be decided that this is, you know, some sort of decadent art or something doesn't give us the right message yeah. and someone could destroy it at some point. Not likely, but you know, yeah. possible. No, absolutely. And I think that that's also why it's really important to have, <coughs> excuse me, different perspectives on stories as well, that there isn't like, because there isn't one definitive story yes. about this. You know, there's your experiences. There's so many different experiences. Yes. And yes. I think that all plays into that, which is lovely as well. What about your relationship to the artist himself? Like, like, what was that going in? And do you feel like a, not a kinship, but like, how, how, how do you think of him now? Well, I, so I thought about, you know that the question that sometimes people ask, if you could have a dinner party and invite three <laughs> people from the past, and I thought, I don't think I would invite him. Like, he would, <laughs> he would just, he just struck me as, uh, as being unknowable in a way, mm. you know, and he was so focused and concentrated on his work and and didn't seem particularly friendly. He didn't, you know, so I felt like he was just all about God and art and his art. And so to you know, personally, he probably wasn't, uh, you know, someone that I would want to spend time with. I mean, he had friends. He was with Vittoria, Victor, Vittoria Colonna. He was um, very close to her. He had other people who, who were his friends, but he just didn't seem like someone that um, I could relate to so much mm. personally. He was a brooder, and there's that image in Raphael's painting of um, the School of Athen Athens that he paints Michelangelo as Heraclitus, and he, he's... That to me is like, that's who that guy is. He's just sitting there kind of, everyone else is busy with intellectual thoughts and he's got his head down like this. He just looks like he's suffering <laughs> from his thoughts. So I think that that's how, how I see him. Mm -hmm. And he would probably, you know, if you could imagine bringing him forward, all of a sudden he'd be shocked to see a, a woman like me going around passing judgment on his work, <laughs> like that would be, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll pass. Yeah. <laughs> We're not having dinner yeah, with Michelangelo, no. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really interesting, all of the research that you pull in and in, in such an accessible way. Like, I'm wondering, as you were going through, did you find, like, conflicting accounts or, like, um, things you had to, like, assume as, I guess, truths, I guess, as you were, like, reading about things? Well, I had to, uh, I mean, when I wasn't doing my own original research, I'm using all these mm -hmm. sources because I'm, I'm not an expert, so, yeah. and I figured the experts have done all this work, so I'm reading all of their books. Um, not so much conflicting things, but uh, certainly, uh, you know, you would read the same thing again and again, and sometimes I would think, how do I make that fresh? Mm -hmm. You know, how do I how do I even feel that in a way that is fresh, and uh, and also with the the historical period as well. There are I've read so many books about the sack of Rome, and so many of them tell you the same stories again and again that I had to sort of find my way through it to make it something that made sense to me, mm -hmm. that I could actually see, so that I could tell the story in a way that wasn't just parroting what the historians have already written. I think the art world has done a fantastic job in terms of um, alienating people, <laughs> um, making people feel like they're not smart enough to get art or writing about it in such a way that, like, I don't know, it's just not accessible or it's, it's for an exclusive club or something. And I think that's why a lot of people kind of pulled back from galleries and museums because of that. Yeah, the, the sort of sense that art is elitist. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I do, I actually am trying to write something about that now because mm. uh, um, my brother and I have had these discussions quite a bit about the uh, idea of why do we think it's elitist? What yeah. is it about it? And it is sometimes the way that people approach it or the way they write about it, or they write about it assuming a kind of knowledge or there's a lot of jargon um, that is alienating and even when I was writing about it and I would tell some people, what do you write about? Oh, the Sistine Chapel. You know, and they would sort of look at me like, how are you writing about the Sistine Chapel? Well, you'll see. You know? <laughs> but it was, it, was that, it, it was a little bit, I felt a bit like, well, I did question myself quite often, should I really? But I kept thinking, the art is not there just for experts. The art is there for everyone to see it. And so, of course, I should write about it in the way that a non-expert is looking at. I'm a non-expert, so I'm looking at it. So I should write about it in that way and not try to pretend that I'm an expert or anything. And I think that allowed me to take a more casual mm -hmm. approach and to, to braid in other stories that I felt were relevant, that were about the experience rather than just about what's actually, a, you know, what, it, what are the pictures that we're looking at. It's actually also about the experience. And I think it's, um, but I think it is important to get away from that sense that only, only people who have a certain knowledge can understand art. And that comes up in certainly in modernist art quite often because you look and you think, what does it mean? Don't really get it, don't know what it is. And that's half the, that's half the fun in a way. And I think it should be more, uh, more invigorating, more fun, more interesting to just look at it and not feel like you have to come to the right answer. And mm -hmm. then, you know, and everyone will look around and agree with each other. Oh, I'm convinced that some of them don't know what they're writing about. I'm convinced of that too. Yeah. <laughs> I actually had an idea for an art speak generator where you could just like put in some general things. Like AI would be perfect yes. for that and it would just spew out the exhibition catalog at the end because yeah. sometimes I'm like, I don't know what you're saying. I yes. really don't. No, the jargon <laughs> gets know? in the way. But there's also, I, I really loved writers like Robert Hughes, who was so irreverent in his writing about art, that it made me feel like I, I can never write like him. I mean, he's really, a, he, he was really irreverent, but I would like to have some of that spirit, at least that mm -hmm. kind of openness. And also John Berger, of course, who was mm -hmm. incredibly, look, it's like he looked at things and saw images and paintings and the way that no one else did and suddenly you can't see them yeah you can't unsee what he saw afterwards so those were those were sort of my guiding spirits mm. i would say it is such a refreshing take to have your personal view on it and like there's some vulnerabilities that comes with that too about admitting like i don't know this 
Yeah. You know, here's my perspective. Um, you also, sorry, I keep doing that. Um, some of the other threads that you braid in are interesting too. Like you even, like you're able to pull in so many different things. Like you talk about the art market, um, you know, how did some of those other threads start appearing or um, in the essays? Um, sort of naturally. And sometimes I have to give my brother, who's back there, I have to give him credit because we, uh, we talk about these things sometimes, mm -hmm. especially when he would come to visit in Rome. And he would challenge me on more of things when I would talk about things in a more like, you know, when I was accepting certain points of view, he would challenge me and make me think about it. One of the things was the art market. I remember we had like the longest fight ever just <laughs> went on and on about what's the value of art and how do you actually value oh, it? Boy. Is it money? Is it, <laughs> it uh, what else is it? If it isn't money, then how do we value it? And that really made me think about it mm. a lot and actually look into it. And Robert Hughes is one of the people who really did mm -hmm. a lot of thinking and writing about it in the 70s and the 80s about how it was, how um, seeing art only in terms of dollar value was really destroying any hope we had of understanding what else it could actually mean to us. And that was, that was kind of fun. So I should have credited Danny a little bit more on that. But. <laughs> um, was there anything that you wanted people to take away from this book? Like, did you have a reader in mind as you were, do you need to have a reader in mind as you're? I, well, I think I had myself as a reader in mind mm -hmm. in a way. And uh, because I did include, I included personal things. It's inevitable if you're going to write about how you experience art, you have to write about your own, who you are a little bit and why you are experiencing it that way. But I, of course, it's funny when you're writing something and you're writing it because it's interesting to you and then you get to a point and think, but is anyone else going to mm. find this interesting? And that's, that's when I had to take it and give it to other people to read it to see if it was interesting. And I gave it to my husband because he's a pretty tough judge and, uh, and he liked it. So I thought, okay, that's good. That's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a moment just before I was about to publish it and I thought, oh my God, people are going to read this. And that was, that was that moment of like horror. And I thought, I have to take all the personal bits out, scrub them, scrub it out right now. <laughs> and, uh, but I didn't do that because it would have made no sense mm -hmm. had I done that. But it was a moment of, of slight terror when I realized that. Or that the, uh, conversely, that no one is going to read this. You know? <laughs> it's oh. going to go out there and no one's going to read it. <laughs> you can't tell until you publish something whether it will hit, you know, land mm -hmm. with people or not. You just don't know. Mm -hmm. So it is funny because we do talk, and I was a journalist for a long time, and we mm -hmm. talk about the reader and the audience so often, but I actually find in creative writing, you have to not think about the reader, and you have to think about yourself and what you actually are trying to say, not so much what you think other people want to hear. Right. It has to be more about you're actually saying something, and they, may, they might find it interesting, they might not find it interesting. So it's a risk, but, but I do think it's... Um, you know, you, you can come, you can find some very interesting books and paintings if people mm -hmm. just come from inside and bring it to you. Was that an easy shift going from journalism to more of a creative nonfiction? Well, uh, I don't, didn't think about it so clearly, but I, I did, uh, when I was doing journalism, I, I worked at a newspaper for a while and I was always nervous as a reporter because everything is about the facts and the facts and you know, and I liked the facts and everything, but I, would, I was always trying to slip in some kind of uh, observation, some small thing just for fun. And then half the time the editors would take it out. And, but it was, uh, so for me it was, I realized I wanted to do something that was more creative than, than, the, journal, than the kind of journalism I was doing. And, so I started writing kind of essays that I would publish in more literary magazines, and that was freeing. And then, and then writing this book was really, you know, for me it was a great experience. I certainly enjoyed doing it. It was an opportunity to really go deeply into a subject and really, really explore it and, and try to make it interesting to myself and, and to others. So that was. Yeah, not a, not obvious to have been a journalist and then do that. Yeah, such a personal commitment to you know 
to do that and to stick with the subject. And I'm obsessive. I am. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> I once ate, ate this risotto that was the most delicious risotto, and I spent about six months <laughs> making it like two, two times a week. And uh, when I finally got it really good, I didn't make it anymore. It was like I just, <laughs> so I realized that I do have these obsessions. And there were, once we had the cupcake period, Nicholas can attest to that. <laughs> and <laughs> so I think it's the same kind of thing. It's mm. like I have to, you know, kind of go right into it and I have to follow it through or I have to understand it. And then uh, I kept saying to my husband, I wonder if I'll get to a point where it's like, okay, I'm done. I'm not going to the Sistine Chapel anymore. But I did, the last time I went was in May, and I would probably go okay. more frequently, but I've been traveling a bit, so yeah. I haven't been able to. And I kind of feel like I'd like to go again. I'd like to visit. So the, pressure must the obsession be off. is still holding, yeah. Yeah, the pressure must be off a little bit then. Yes, yes. I could just go and look at it now. <laughs> no notes.